about giving this series of teachings on the gospel. Because every time that I do a video series, it's not as though I know everything or that I am the wisest man in the world. <laughs> God, not me. But it's always as though I'm investigating, you know, and I'm curious about something that God has said. Say this, tell this, teach this, or do this. You know, and so everything that I do on video is always directed by God because if it wasn't, as soon as I get done with it, I delete it. <laughs> Wait, you think I'm stupid? I'm going to leave it, all my garbage out there? Of course not. No, but seriously, I, I anything that's posted up on the internet is all over the internet, so, you know, that's pretty obvious. But in the gospel, you know, a lot of times people get this wrong idea about the gospel. You know, they they make it all out to be, oh, by the way, I hope you don't mind if I eat. You know, I tend to enjoy eating because when I'm hungry, I eat. When I'm thirsty, I drink. Ah, and this is my burger from last night. It's leftovers. I love it. <laughs> Uh, I know some people are going, ooh, gross, you know, but me, personally, oh, man, whatever I don't eat for dinner, I eat for breakfast, you know, I can't finish it, so I had two uppers, and uh, this is, by the way, for all you healthy Christians out there, ah, love it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but anyways, the reason why I show you this and eat it is because you might be, you know, a health food fanatic. Been there, done that. No, I've been there where, you know, veggie this, veggie that, you know. Down Southern California, you know, gave up meat and ate beans and did rice and took vitamins and tried to live healthy and nearly died. No. <laughs> But I've been there for a year or two. Gave up Pepsi. God, that must have been a shock. But all of us are unique and distinctive and different. Each and every one of us. For some, this might be the worst thing in the world for you. And I would say, good. More for me. <laughs> but for others, this might be delicious. Might be just the amount of calories you need. Just might be kind of like what Paul said. You know, any deadly thing that you ate, that don't affect you because you're doing what God told you to do. So for me, I just need to get calories in because I'm burning them up as fast as I'm putting them in. But the point of it all is, is in the gospel, somehow we've gotten this idea that one size fits all. You know, you stand up and Everybody needs to know that they're a sinner. Everybody needs to know they need to confess their sins. Everybody needs to know this, that, and the other thing. I don't know about you, but... Can I ask you something? Can I get a little personal for a minute? Besides, you know, eating? But seriously, think about it. Look at a modern day ultra call. You know, Oh, the altar doesn't call? Oh, well. You know, people getting up and giving the four spiritual laws or getting up and doing the Billy Graham, Billy Graham evangelism principles of making sure you know you're a sinner. 
you know you need God and there's a choice between heaven and hell and you got to make it now. Because you could die today. And it's true, you could. But I often wonder when I'm looking at the Bible all the different ways that Jesus saved people. It seems to me he met them where they're at. He addressed them in their heart. He knew what they needed to hear at the time they needed to hear it. Don't get me wrong. I understand great evangelists, you know, having their presentations. But I think God really wasn't about thousands of people coming to Him because He always seemed to drive off the thousands that always seemed to follow Him. But He dealt with the one-to-one. -one. And I think that's what the Gospel's about. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think God deals with people one-to-one. -one. So, maybe when I look out on all these thousands of people getting saved, maybe there aren't quite so many getting saved as it looks like. And maybe our message shouldn't be quite the way we're doing it. Maybe everyone should be sharing with their household the individual truth of what they've seen, what they've heard, what they've handled with their own hands. Maybe it's kind of like Andrew running to his brother and saying, Hey, look, you'll never believe it. I've been talking to the Messiah. I found him. I found the one they've been talking about. You know, the one that everybody's been predicting is going to come. I found him. I think that maybe our gospel isn't about getting crowds and becoming evangelists and apostles and prophets and all these people that run around with all these titles trying to build these huge outreaches. But I think maybe it's a little more personal than that. You see, if I'm just one of the crowd, I'm not so sure I'm that important. You know, oh sure, kumbaya, and, you know, like, oh, well, we're having a moment. <laughs> You know, we're all together, you know, singing Alleluia, you know, and doing our, you know, religious thing. And don't get me wrong, God can use anything He wants to use, even a jackass. So, if He's going to use a donkey to speak, I'm sure He can use a televangelist, or a cyber evangelist, or a mega evangelist. But you know, I didn't get saved by a mega evangelist. I got saved when it was small and tiny. A little place called Calvary Chapel Riverside. Back when it was called that. You see, it wasn't originally called Harvest. And back then, not everybody had it all together. And you know what? When I got saved, about the time that they were going to, you know, like do this massive everybody come forward and everybody, you know, do this prayer, you know, communication thing, you know, and we all came forward to the stage. Because there were so few of us, Greg said, tell you what, instead, I want you to go in the back with the bros. And I went, what? And I had been watching, you know, this typical way that they always say people, you know, kind of like, you know, I saw everybody glowing and flowing, you know, and doing their thing, you know, and everybody would go forward and there'd be hundreds of people going forward, you know, and so I always thought that it was safe until the time that I decided to go forward. And then God said, uh-uh, I got that one, huh, watch this, fooled you. <laughs> and he says, no, I'm not going to let you get away with being one of the crowd. I'm going to move you in the back. And so when they went to the back room to pray, you know, a little prayer room, which was just off to the side, really, you know, there was a big bro on one side, because I would have ran, and there was a little bro on the other side, and they kind of put their hands on me, you know, kind of one on one arm, and you know, the other hanging on to my neck, because God knows I would have ran like crazy, because after I found out they weren't going to just do this massive prayer like you see in the great revivals, you know. Yes, I'll accept Jesus. Now give me a Bible and let me go home. Well, they kind of prayed for me right there. They said, do you want to accept Jesus? And I said, yeah. And they said, okay, let's pray. Um, you know, like they knew what they were doing. I don't know if they knew what they were doing, but man, bam! All of a 
sudden, from the top of my head to the tip of my toes, boom, 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 you know, I was like, ah, wow, cool, praise the Lord. You know, and the bros go, yeah, man, praise the Lord, you did great, cool, isn't it, Jesus, wonderful, yeah, yeah man, Jesus, cool, man, he's going to bless me out, so cool, you know, thank you, well, uh, uh, you know, I was, wow, Zers. I was wowed, I was blown out. You know, it was what most people would have said was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it wasn't because later that came later and that was like, wow, and I didn't even know what was happening then either. It wasn't like in front of some great, you know, let's stand up and knock them down, you know, slain in the spirit kind of thing, you know. It was more like, you know, we were just like four or five of us sitting around in a little prayer meeting, you know, a little home Bible study, and I was speaking in tongues, and I was feeling worse than I felt before, which was better. The point is, God knew directly, personally, what I needed was to be filled, was to be overloaded, was to be emotionally responsive to Him on a one-to-one -one basis. And you see, that's kind of the way that I see the Gospel. I see it kind of like dealing with a person one-to-one. -one. You know. Mm hmm. Kind of like messy. Yeah, I see the gospel as messy. Yeah, because you're dealing with people. You know, kind of like that guy that's dying on the cross, you know. Lord, <laughs> remember me when you come into your kingdom, because, yeah, I deserve to die. Jesus said, hey, you're with me in paradise, buddy. We're going there. Why? Well, nobody knows, really. And the truth is, is because God looks on the outward things, man looks on the heart. God had already seen his heart and seen what he would have done if he had not been hanging on that cross. He already knew that the man would have given his life for Jesus. So, it wasn't really about that one moment, but it was about the sum total of the man's life that God could see in his heart. And that brings me to the point. This whole issue about free will versus predestination and, you know, foreordained and, you know, some are called to salvation, some are called to damnation, you know, and God's will is such that none should perish but all should come to eternal life and all the other theologies that everybody's trying to explain why there's God saying this and then God making an exception here and an exception there and an exception there and an exception there. Well, they aren't exceptions. They're directions. God directs his salvation the way he chooses. He gives us grace. And it's by grace we're saved. And that not of ourselves, but it is a gift of God that he gives according to his mercy and his grace that he saved us. That he did through the accomplishment of the work of his son so that it would be declared to the universe of what salvation is and how God deals equitably with the entire universe of creation. Even to those angels that were in rebellion and even to the principality powers of spiritual wickedness and all the other things that are going on that are watching all that's being accomplished for our salvation so somehow when I look at these pre-programmed little packets of salvation I kind of go mm, no you see whatever it is that God uses at the time he uses you know like the wind blowing through right now Ooh. A little chilly. It gave me goosebumps. Spirit of God. Maybe it is. But I allow the Holy Spirit to lead and to use and to direct as He chooses because that's what salvation is. That's the Spirit of God working in a man to cause him the realization of knowing that God is real and that man needs to know God in a personal and intimate way. God reveals himself to man and that is salvation. What a man does with that is his choice of damnation or realization of the salvation that God has provided for him. That's the point. It's not pre-programmed. It's preordained. It's written. It's already inscribed in the Book of Life. Might be blotted out. Be careful. But the point is, you exist and existed and you're unique and you're special and you're different. So God 
will at times speak to you a little differently than he speaks to someone else. He might be choosing to save someone a little differently than he saves the thousands that came at the last revival that we had. Oh, you know, they can only get saved during, you know, once a year at our revival meetings. Sorry. The rest of the time, eh, not time. No. You see, God saves, even as he did with, oh, I guess it was Raw Reese. I was watching a television program. God saves, you know, even as um, some other people, like me going to a concert or someone else meeting Jesus, you know, in the back of a VW, you know, that he appears and then speaks to him and then disappears. What? That must have been eye-opening. Or someone who dies and has this experience, you know, where they say they've been to heaven, you know, don't know if they did, but, you know, as long as they don't tell me they've been to hell, well, I'm fine. But if they tell me they've been to hell and heaven, I'm eh, wrong, not according to Scripture. But the point is, God, in the book of books, the Bible, has revealed himself in a variety of ways, from Genesis all the way through Revelation. One minute you got John being snatched up into heaven so he could see what's going to happen. The next minute you got who? What's his name? Enoch disappearing because he is no more because he found favor with God and walked away. Woo! And was no more. He walked away with God. So, whenever people get wrapped up into boxing God into this nice little, you know, what a box is, right? Like this. Whenever you box God up, mmm, mm, delicious. God's going to operate outside the box. Look at me. <laughs> Not like him. But taking the principles that may be a Billy Graham or a Greg Laurie or a Bill Bright, Roman Road, Woman at the Well. I have heard so many teachings on the woman at the well and how she got saved. Did you know? I'm a little tired of hearing the teaching. That doesn't look like a salvation message to me. Sorry. I might disagree with some of you people. The point is, Jesus revealed himself to the woman. The woman was dealing face to face with Jesus. That's the message. Not about what he said to her. Oh, he revealed everything that I ever did. It's about the relationship they had with each other. God was working on her from the beginning. Jesus came along at the point of contact when she was ready to be, as he said, harvested, as he shared with her the truth. Hey, I'm he. I'm the Messiah. Really? Yeah. Go call your husband. You know, he just said things that were common, normal. You know, maybe a little insight, you know, but still common. Things that God told him to say. But they weren't. Things the disciples said, I got it, Jesus. Now, I'm going to the next well, and I'll do it this time. I'm going to go find me a woman sitting at a well, and I'm going to go get her saved. No! You get it? In other words, it's not the principles of always telling people that they're a sinner and they're saved by grace and you know, whatever it may be that you're, you're into at the moment, you know, of your understanding, you know. You should understand that, you know, the realization is that the process of salvation is accomplished through the growing relationship that they have with God. So you're introducing people to God in a personal and intimate way, relating to them that which God has said is the good news, that you can know God. That you could know the Father, that God will speak to you. God will reveal himself to you. Because of Jesus, you can know God our Father, and you can know that there is a Creator, and you can know Jesus personally and intimate in a real way. He can speak to you. You can hear his voice. There's more to life than the physical. There's more than what you can see, touch, feel. 
You know, that kind of stuff. So, about the time of my salvation, maybe a little before, the church had decided in its steeple that uh, <clears throat> you couldn't open the doors to see all the people because there was nobody going. Everybody had decided, eh, church is for those kind of people. We want these kind of people. You know, long hair, hippie style, you know, kind of like, well, you know, we don't agree with the government, and we don't agree with society, and we don't agree with commercialism, and we don't agree with, you know, the yuppie vision. Oh, wait a minute, yuppies hadn't come yet. We don't agree with, you know, making money and all that stuff. So we're going to drop out of society. Because after all, the world just doesn't make sense to us. And so a bunch of us did that. You know what? God knows when the Time Magazine came out and said, the church is dead, God said, no, I'm not. <laughs> Actually, they said, God is dead. And God said, no, I'm not. God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's working on the inside. Well, not in those days. He was working on the outside and the inside. He was working all over the sides. Matter of fact, he went outside the box. And he began to move in the hearts and minds of people everywhere. Not just the hippies. He saved people with shirts and ties. He saved people in suits. He saved people around the world at that time. And people forget that part. It was the greatest revival in history. People forget that part. People weren't saying, be born again. They were saying it after the Jesus movement, but not before. They were saying, God is dead. And so, from around the world, the Holy Spirit decided, I'm moving outside the box. And he saved individual people, and they affected the church. Because the church had closed itself off to Jesus. It had so structured life and salvation and religion that no longer was Jesus welcome on the inside. So the Spirit of God moved on the outside to reveal Jesus to those who were standing, looking for God. The Jesus movement did create a lot of changes in the church. And today we see that. But you see, likewise, as man is typical of doing, over the years, instead of you know sticking with it, the Jesus movement, who had been saying, "Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming," grew up. They got old. They started having children. They started settling in, overcoming. You know, being a part of the world in its ways. Oh, sure, still telling their kids. Get saved. But now it's more of a kind of layback kind of thing. Yeah, you know, we sing little songs from the Jesus movement in Sunday school. We teach them to our kids. Yeah, Jesus is coming sooner or later, but he didn't come when we thought so. Though we are that baby boomer generation that changed the world, though we are those Jesus freaks that once were the talk of the town, so to speak, we got our big churches, we got our budgets, we got our families, we got our Harleys, and we got things to do, people to see, places to go. Yeah, the gospel's good, but we've, uh, Got a package now. You know, just pick up your iPhone. You know, you can check out the gospel. Just click on Gospel 101. Get saved and come to church. Come see me and talk to me about your problems, you know. I'll tell you what I've been through. So, with a bigger and better box from Yuppies, we have the digital era. But God operated outside the box again. He started going to other countries. He started doing things like with whosoever's or with rock stars. You know, saying, hey, you know what? It's not about you standing up in front of the crowd, getting all the glory. It's about me who's putting you inside those situations so that you could turn the glory to me. Now, the whosoever's, sadly, as big as they've gotten, likewise have made the same mistakes that the Jesus people did. And they're following the same path. 
Oh, let's get commercial about it. <laughs> yeah, we're still fighting to murder the flesh, but let's sell a few things on the side. <laughs> oh, murder the flesh t-shirts, you know, key rings, you know, chains. Let's get everybody involved, you know. Let's still do our tasks. Let's still get our, you know, gospel mixed in, you know, kind of with our whosoever logo, so we make sure whosoever is the glorification and not Jesus. Because after all, we're not talking about Jesus anymore. We're talking about whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who's the Lord again? Sometimes some of the whosoevers forgot who it is. And that's why every movement has a time and a purpose under the sun. Time to be born, time to die, time to be a part of God's anointing and a part that it's no longer part of God's doing. Because you see, the gospel that goes out wasn't about some whosoever. It wasn't about some Greg Laurie. It wasn't about some Billy Graham. But it was about you telling someone else about Jesus. It's about the personal relationship that you have one-on-one -on -one with God Almighty. The things that I have seen, the things that I have heard, the things that I have handled with my own hands, that we declare unto you. That's what John said. And you see, the difference between John and Peter, the difference between John and Paul, the difference between John and every other disciple is one thing, and one thing alone. There's no other thing. Well, there's two things, but one other thing that I make it a point of. There might be three or four things, but anyways, one thing I make it a point of. I can always think of exceptions. <laughs> Boy, let me tell you. But the one thing that really becomes clearly obvious in the gospel about the difference between John and all these other disciples is John is the disciple Jesus loved. The disciple Jesus loved. And why? Why when you see with John and some of his brethren, you see him sometimes making some real blunders, just like everybody else. Why is it John was loved? You see John a lot of times sticking close to Jesus no matter what. You see John wanting to be with Jesus no matter what. Staying at his breast, right there at his side, no matter what. He didn't care about all the theologies in the world. He didn't care about all the practicalities in the world. John seemed to always be by Jesus' side. And because Jesus looked on John and loved him, he even said to his own mother, Behold your son, and committed his mother's care into John's. It's interesting that John was the beloved because really, he stayed by Jesus' side. He got it. The closer he was to Jesus, the more he understood the mysteries of who Jesus was. The fascination of how the Word could become flesh and dwelt among us. How in him we see that John was given a promise that you should not die till you finally saw who I am in my glory. Because Jesus wanted John to see him as he really was. Even Peter began to become jealous of John. Uh, what about him? And Jesus said, don't worry about him. You follow about me. You see, Jesus didn't have to tell John to follow him. John loved him so much that they became beloved. Be loved. And that's the point of salvation. It's not the fear of God that draws men to repentance. It's the love of God that draws men to repentance. You don't get up and declare... Though some may come for fear, oh, God's going to condemn you. God's going to hang you over, you know, the pit of hell. And unless you get saved, he's going to cut the string and you'll die. He doesn't come to you and say, look, it's over. You don't get to do what you want to do anymore. I'm in charge. I'm the creator. Go to hell. No. He says, if any man come unto me, I, will, I won't cast him out. If anyone come call upon me, I will not just 
I will not leave them. I will answer them. I will be there for them. Yet, because God will not leave us to ourselves, but rather give us the opportunity to cry out to Him, to know Him as a Father, to know Him not as God, the Almighty, even though He is a heart of love, so to speak, but to know Him as Father, Daddy, personal and intimate in such a real way that you would say, today I can hear His voice because He loves me. Today I can walk with Him because He loves me. Today I know Him because He loves me. And I could ask Him for salvation and He would save me. So, this message that we communicate isn't all about sin and salvation and what Jesus has done. It is about knowing our Father in heaven and knowing Jesus, His Son, whom He sent. Because Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they should know me and know Him who sent me. And so the message sometimes we communicate has to be customized and coordinated to the individual of what that person knows, sees, and understands at the moment they knew it. There were more people saved in the Jesus movement by people who didn't know what they were doing than people who actually did know what they were doing. Today I see thousands of people come in great evangelistic outreaches and I say, well, praise the Lord, I hope some of them are saved because I don't expect all of them to be. Because quite frankly, I have seen thousands come forward thousands of times. And the reality is, they'll come back next year and do the same thing to make sure they're saved. God works individually by His Spirit, and so He does save in those great evangelistic outreaches. But Jesus worked personally on the person, one to one, even as He did with you. You are called to go out and make disciples of all nations, one to one. You're not called to go out and make great evangelistic crusades. Sorry, nowhere in the scripture does it say, I want you to go out and make crusades. It doesn't say, Few are called, many are chosen. But the reality of the gospel is that it's a personal decision of a one-to-one -one relationship with God on an individual basis. And that has to be the realization that what we communicate in our gospel has got to be the knowledge of God himself one-on-one. -on -one. Or we are lying to people and deceiving ourselves to think that those people who hear the message that we bring has anything to do with what we are sharing about a personal knowledge of God Himself. We placed God inside of a box and we made Him nothing more than just a burger to be drive through and given out as though something that could be freely taken and accepted as though grace were something that could be bought and sold on the marketplace of Christianity and then drive by and get what you want so that you can do what you want when you want. That's not salvation. Ever. Never has been. Never will be. But you know what? I can open up that box of man's ideas. You know? Hmm. I can taste and see what's on the inside. Hmm. And me personally, I can taste and see that the Lord is good because I can see the good of what men are trying to do when they put God in a box. But you know, in video gospel, I'm not here to study the gospel. I'm not here to give you a box so that you can put what you want in it. I'm here to demonstrate and to relate to you something personal and real that just you saw right before your very eyes. Taste it. See it. Taste and see if the Lord is good. Check it out. Look at the Word. Find out the gospel that God wants you to bring. The gospel might not be the way you think you should do it. The gospel might be something very strange. It might happen over a burger or two. It could occur someplace on a street corner. It might be sitting on a beach. Might be getting a phone call in the middle of the night. Might be telling your children when they're going to bed, going to sleep, 
Would you like to ask Jesus to be with you? You see, one thing that Jesus people learned about having children that grew up in the church, not all those children knew the Lord. Though they were righteous children, they were godly. A great majority of those children have said, yeah, I was raised in a Christian home, and I went to church, you know, I even went to Calvary chapels. But you know, I really didn't know the Lord until one day. And you hear that in their life, and you know, yeah, God invaded their life at that moment. Then they knew God personally. And that's the difference between what salvation is and what salvation is preached. What salvation is, is the knowledge of God in a personal and intimate way. That's what saves you. That's what salvation is, because Jesus said so. Eternal life would be this, that they should know me and know him who sent me. So, our demonstration, our relation of what we give to people in the good news is that you can know God. You can have a knowledge of God, a relationship with God, a communication with God, and you can hear God speak. That last statement is probably the one that gets me in the most trouble with Christians everywhere. Because they say to me, Michael, you can't be teaching people that, you know, they can hear God speak. I said, why not? Well, because, you know, they might listen to other voices. So? Don't you? Well, yeah, but I, I, I don't follow those voices. I said, okay, so what does the scripture say? Well, it says, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. They will not follow the voice of another. So you're telling me that I shouldn't tell people that they can hear Jesus speak? You're telling me that I shouldn't let people know that they're supposed to hear God speak? That they can audibly hear the voice of God at some point in time in their life? And maybe on a continuing basis they could probably be like Enoch and walk away to heaven and not have to go through all this hell? You're telling me that I should deny them that gospel? Well, yeah, because that's not safe. Bring them to church. Let them learn in church. Let them hear the voice of man first. Let them be discipled. Let them grow up into... Yeah, okay, let me get this right. So, Eddie... The great high priest told Samuel, Look, I want you to follow in my footsteps because I raised my kids wrong. I want you to be raised wrong like I did so that way you'll be just like my kids are who wound up being discommunicated from God and even condemned by God. Instead, you know, Samuel, I want you to follow me and go back to sleep and ignore the voice you heard calling out to you. Right? That's what you're telling me? You see, God will intervene any way, any shape, any form, and any time He wants to. But the Bible says today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation. I don't tell you that you have to hear His voice through my voice. I don't tell you that you have to hear His voice through my words. I don't tell you that you have to hear His voice through the Scriptures. What I tell you is you have to hear what the scripture says. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Excuse me. Samuel heard the voice of God. Samuel. What? So he goes and wakes up to Eddie. Finally, Eli says, look, you know, quit bugging me. Go back to sleep. But if the voice comes up and says, here I am, Lord. Speak. Your servant listens. You, when you hear the gospel from God, just say that. Okay, Lord, I'm listening. What do you want? That's the point. We're told, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. You can hear an iPod. You can hear a phone ring. You can hear the cars. You can hear the wind. You can hear a lot of voices in the world and a lot of practical things that all assault your ability to hear. But if you can hear all those things, why can't you hear the voice of God speak when God has promised it? That's the gospel. 